time implementation and of course make it available for in-situ visualization and analysis and also an online control. So perhaps some of you recognize these slides because this is one of the slides at least that we had in the presentation. So what it's all about is we want to forecast state and fluxes. And we want to forecast these state and fluxes at least down to a scale of 50 meters and below. And as soon as we get sensor data, we can use this sensor data to update our model. And by updating our model, we hope that we improve, again, the states, the forecast of states and fluxes. So it's a kind of a loop that progresses in time. What I'm going to talk about is, is a two-stage approach here. I'm going to first talk about the Threshold System Modeling Platform that also has been developed in the TR32, that is also part of the Competence Center of um, High Performance Scientific Computing Threshold Systems from the Geo Alliance. And then I will tell something about ways to go down to the 0 to 50 meter scale. And here is a slide that shows the full setting. So these digital agricultural avatars, they start at the continental scale. And at the continental scale, we can use our simulation platform. I will talk a bit later about it. That integrates the subsurface environment, the land surface and the atmosphere. And we can do these simulations at this scale between 3 and 10 kilometer scale. And you get a full resolution of the whole system in terms of energy balance, uh, water balance, and um, matter balance. Then we can downscale this to a region the size, let's say, 150 by 150 kilometers, which might be kind of uh, North Time Westphalia, perhaps a bit smaller. And within this area, we will downscale again using uh, the same simulation platform, but now using also large eddy simulations to further downscale this to a resolution of 50 meters. And the way we do this, uh, what we want to do this is also by injecting data in order to improve the calculations and the forecast. going to talk a bit more about this. This is the framework that has uh, been developed also within TR32. There are three models that are coupled here for this European NRW scale. And then the second is the largest, uh, the, the scale of the field where this box 10 by 10 kilometer, remember the box, <coughs> we can downscale there to 50 meters. And this part, I will talk later about, is how to resolve the subgrid variability with respect to crop growth in a, this 0 to 50 meter scale. So we operate three models that are fully coupled. This is the power flow model, which does all the subsurface calculations of the water flow and the matter flow. This is the land surface model that does the energy exchange but that also does the biogeochemistry in terms of fluxes of CO2 and nitrogen, or carbon and nitrogen fluxes. And this is basically the atmospheric part. It's a weather model that uh, is run and that fully uh, solves all the states and fluxes within the atmosphere. These are coupled. You see the exchanges that occur. These are coupled by an OASIS coupler. And uh, this model is run at the continental scale. We use a similar approach. At, in a downscaled way, but exchange the cosmos with the ICON large eddy simulation model, just to resolve also the turbulency to, be to basically better model the atmosphere, and this then goes down to a scale of 50 meters. This is not yet done in Finerop, at least not the 50 meter scale. We still have to do this. This is just what we are working on, and that might be something I think worthwhile to consider in uh, Finerop. So I have here 
Oh. Somehow it should work. It doesn't. Now, anyway, that's a bit of a pity. What you should see is that this rain front is entering into the box and that this rain front produces rain and then you see the change in soil moisture content on the land surface. And this is the one-way part, but the land surface also couples back to the atmosphere. So it's a two-way feedback. That means that um, the land surface also affects the state of the atmosphere. And let's see if I can get it running. Fortunate. Yeah, I can show. No worries. Not going to spend my time on it. So anyway, this is the the whole uh, modeling platform that we plan to use in Finorop. So the par flow is doing the subsurface part of the land surface, and basically we solve their three-dimensional. Uh, Richard's equation for variably saturated systems. Then we have the, the land surface, which is done by the community land model. And then we have this integrated weather and large eddy simulation model, Cosmo Icon uh, LEM. And um, this is part also work that is done in HPSC Terzis. And then there is a coupling done by this Oasis 3. And the the way to inject information from remote sensing or from sensors or from drones is using this parallel data assimilation framework. And so this uh, model is available and operational. Now, what can this terrestrial surface model platform provide at a 50 meter resolution? It provides information on all the surface energy fluxes, provides the information about the hydrology of the system, and it provides information about the biogeochemical cycles, carbon and nitrogen. Of course, using, in this case, simplified versions on how to describe the vegetation. These are plant functional types. In the TR32, we have been working on introducing crop-specific parameters that was part of, of uh, the work we've done there. So we can improve this also with respect to specific crops we want to look at. And this is uh, here an example of simulations that have been done. So this is 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. The spatial resolution is 50 meters. And you can see that we resolve this soil moisture at this scale. You see also the heterogeneity heterogeneity in there. This is also related to evapotranspiration fluxes and we get also information about the uh, maximum vertical wind velocity and about the maximum horizontal wind velocity. So this is basically what such uh, a framework can offer and you see of course if you go to 50 meters we are coming at a scale that is relevant for the management. And just to give you a feeling what 50 by 50 meters means this is part of Klein Altendorf, and I just put on a mesh of 50 by 50 meters. So you can see that some of these pixels are exactly within one field, some of these pixels are mixed. So what basically what we do with the simulation platform is, for such a pixel, let's take this one, we provide the full state of the subsurface, the crop, and the atmosphere. So you will get a mean water content, 
you will get a mean evapotranspiration flux, you will get a mean, the mean fluxes of the energy balance, you can get the CO2 respiration constant over such a 50 by 50 meter scale. That also means in terms of this uh, modeling strategy that any, th any variation that occurs within this 50 by 50 meters, if the crop management is the same and your fertilizer application is the same, assumed by the 50 50 meters, that all of the heterogeneity has to come mostly from the soil. This is what the, what the picture with the drone shows uh, when you look at it, that uh, the heterogeneity that you then observe, and this can also be kind of an hypothesis, is mostly driven by the status of the soil. And this is, of course, this opens perspectives. This opens perspectives for those people that are working with um, ground-based hydrogeophysical methods, uh, EMI, uh, GPR. It also opens perspectives for drones. Come to the next stage. This is then the within plot scale variability at the 0 to 50 meter scale. And this is basically where unmanned automated vehicles come in. At the larger scale, you, it would still be possible to do that. But uh, I think the advantage and the strength of these uh, automated, uh, unmanned automated vehicles, like drones for instance, is at this scale of the 50 meters. Again here, this is where we are. And now we can make use of uh, these drones to inform our models. That's basically the idea. This, uh, these satellites, they can go across all of the scales that I managed, managed, um, mentioned, depending on the spatial resolution of the uh, satellites. Again, the same, the same flowchart, but now we are looking at this part here. And so the idea is to say, okay, <coughs> let's use our crop growth models, like for instance, uh, AgroC, which we are operating, can be any others. And uh, in this case, specific interest of us is to link it with also fluorescence and to use this information to improve the predictions of these crop growth models. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, you get, for instance, that information about uh, gross primary production, above ground respiration, but also yield, crop yield, subsurface uh, biomass, and so on. I will a bit explain about the sucrose, because this is what we are using in the agro sea, just to give you a flavor about what a summary crop, mo crop growth model is about. And so this uh, <coughs> agro sea model has three components. <coughs> this is the subsurface part, and it basically calculates the uh, water and um, heat and CO2 fluxes in the subsurface. It's a 1D approach. This is linked to a carbon model that has different pools where the carbon is distributed and which can also produce CO2. And then you can see we did some model evaluations on, on bare soil where we basically show that the model is doing a good job in terms of uh, predicting for a bare soil in this case, uh, the water contents, but also the uh, CO2 fluxes. The other part is the sucrose, which is quite <coughs> simple summary crop growth model, where you basically uh, distribute the total CO2 that is assimilated in the different parts of the crop and the subsurface root system. And it's, uh, it's not, I mean, you have to specify, for instance, also the development stages of the crop. It's not something that the model calculates. You have to specify. So it's basically a kind of a partitioning of the carbon obtained by photosynthesis through the plant. And um, we have been using this uh, agro C to calculate, for instance, the netto ecosystem exchange of uh, the land surface for a specific crop. And then we can, of course, compare this with uh, measured netto ecosystem exchange fluxes that we get from adequate variants. 
So that is why you, use, uh, you can use that equivariance to get information about the CO2, either respiration or uh, photosynthesis. And you can be compare this with what we have simulated with AgroC. And I think these are the three uh, locations within the TR32 and Torino. And I think these are good results. We have also used this model to look at spatial variability in uh, crop production. And this is a, well, you've seen a part from the drone, probably the drone measured somewhere here, this uh, heterogeneity in crop growth. This is a map made by electromagnetic induction, so geophysical methods, at a one by one kilometer scale. And we use this, it may basically measures conductivity, electrical conductivity, and we use this information to come up uh, after image classification with a kind of a soil map based on drilling at specific locations. And what we then do is we use this soil map to, with the accuracy, to, for instance, simulate the water content, but we can also simulate the productivity, in this case, for 2016 in terms of uh, the yields. And then we compare this a bit. If you look at how it develops, you can recognize the patterns here and the patterns there. So that's also just to illustrate that this solverability at this small scale within the zero to 50 meters plays an important role in predicting uh, productivity of an agricultural field. Just an example, well, this is the way it is done. We have this quad. You have this uh, electromagnetic induction sensors. You just drive across the field. I have a nice, uh, a nice thing here. You just <laughs> drive and drive and you make these loopings and you get information of the subsurface and that you translate into heterogeneity of soils, of the soil system. And um, this is standard technology. This is available. We can use this. This is uh, done, uh, work done by uh, Jan van der Kirk. And uh, yeah, that's, an, that's a nice part of it. <laughs> so anyway, you get crazy after a while, I guess. So the guy who did the work, uh, Cosimo, spent quite some time on doing this one by one kilometers to get it done. So anyway, this allows us to map the subsurface heterogeneity. Just coming back, as I said, that might be very important if you want to do some kind of precision agriculture. So the next thing we can use to inform our models are drones. And these are drones that we are, have currently available in, in Jülich, which we can use for the FINURAP. And this is a very standard RGB camera. We have a thermal camera and a multispectral camera. And the question is, how can we use this information from drones to inform the models? That's the big question. And I want to illustrate it later for a case of uh, fluorescence. What we plan to buy, and this is from funding from uh, another uh, Helmholtz project, is uh, Moses partly, is a LIDAR which allows us basically to get a highly resolved digital elevation model, the microtopography, but also the height of the crop. And the question now is, can we use this information, height of the crop, in our simulation models to improve our, um, the, the prediction or the forecasting of yield? Just to give you a, an example of what we think is possible, how to link these drones with agro -C scope? It can be also G-cross scope. It can be any other crop growth model. Um, we have uh, the multispectral sensor that can provide information about the leaf area index, the APAR, the absorbed photosynthetic synthetic active radiation, the crop type, the thermal infrared we can use because it gives us information about the soil canopy surface temperature. And it is also part as uh, input to the AgroC scope. And the LiDAR, as said, um, provides us information about the height. Now, the height, 
um, is, for instance, for a, a model like uh, sucrose not relevant. You don't, you don't simulate the height. Of course, it is relevant if you're going to do the radioactive transfer modeling using, for instance, the scope to look at the fluorescence. Then you have to have the height. So the LIDAR um, can be used in this respect. Or you have some algorithms, relationships between height and biomass. Then you can transform uh, height in biomass. And then you have also a proxy that you can use in your uh, models. There is one PhD work that is currently ongoing in Jülich, together with the uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, is the early detection of drought stress using sun-induced chlorophyll fluorescence. This PhD start, and the suggestion is that we embed this work into Phenorop. And the motivation for the work is basically uh, data that we... I'm uh, not sure if I had the right presentation, but anyway... Um, data that we obtained from the GOME-2 satellite, which measures the sun-induced fluorescence, which is a direct measure for the photosynthetic activity. This, pic this, this graph here is taken in Texas in a drop period, I think 2016. This one is the Great Plains. The x-axis shows the salt water content anomaly, so the deviation from the mean in the root zone of the soil. And on the y-axis, you have the SIF anomaly. And you see the drier, that would be drier, that would be wetter than on average. You see that the fluorescence decreases as the soil gets drier. Gets the soil wetter, you get more fluorescence. Now, the same information you can also get from drones. You could get that from on-ground monitoring systems like SIF measurements. And um, you see also the, the correlations that occur, you see also the negative uh, correlation with uh, temperature. So this is just to illustrate that there is information content in the uh, fluorescence measurements. And I think Uwe Rascher, is he there? Is the specialist? No, he's not there. Okay. Ah, okay. So that was. So the scope, I explained the agro C. I'm talking about the scope. The top of canopy, top of canopy incoming radiation is input for this model and the weather conditions. And then you have a whole cascading which allows you in the end to calculate in a forward mode the fluorescence. We will be using this part of the model, which is basically the radiative transfer model for the fluorescence, and couple this with the accuracy. That is work that is going to be done. This is not yet work that is finished. And this is just the way... So the basic idea of this graph is I have a model, and this model calculates in a forward matter the signal that is observed by the drone. So this is just the forward modeling of the fluorescence. And here you have a sensor that measures in the same wavelength the spectral induced fluorescence. And then you're going to do, you, you just start an optimization. You optimize by minimizing the difference between what is observed and what is predicted by the model and looking, for instance, at a set of parameters at a specific location. And so one way of, of uh, doing this optimization is if you have parameters that describe the water stress, you try to estimate these parameters from the information that you get. So that helps you in informing your model in terms of how to better parameterize it. In this way, so what we use from the scope is just the radius of transfer model. This is what we want to do. And we inform the scope through our agro C model. And of course, there are many things to consider is how this uh, radiation is distributed in photosynthetic uh, active radiation, non-quenching, heat loss, and also then the uh, leaf level fluorescence. So this is ongoing work. We are thinking on how to model this effect of water stress on the um, photosynthetic activity. So basically, in the end, the model provides leaf biomass and the LAI, and this goes into the radiative transfer model. So that's the whole idea of the loop. And you can also select other parameters, parameters of interest, and this um, might help you in uh, better informing your model. Just an example of how such a water stress function could look like. 
This is a very simple one. This is well known to many people, I guess, from the crop science uh, modeling community, is the FEDIS approach. We have currently other models that could also be used, like Hoover. And basically what we're interested in here, you see just, this is the range where water uptake is optimal, no stress. And these are the areas, weather and drier, where you see a reduction in this uh, uptake function. And basically what one could try to do is say, okay, estimate these two parameters where the shift starts. And these are uh, typically empirical ones. One have to make guesses. So the question is, can we use this information to get improved information about these two uh, parameters? Yeah, so uh, just a bit about the, uh, the fluorescence. So we have this absorbed part, and this is basically distributed into different energy fluxes. So you have uh, a heat flux that is generated. You have a decay. You have the photochemistry and you have also the fluorescence that goes out of the system. And typically, when this, all these fractions should add up to one, the, question, the difficulty is they are not constants. Constant per, uh, currently, they are treated as a constant, but they also depend on the environmental conditions. So the question also will be, can we uh, improve this in terms of estimating these uh, partitioning coefficients of the absorbed power? And then, um, well, the link then is that we can use um, the uh, eddy covariance systems to validate some of uh, the estimates we make. We can use these drones to provide the information. And we have, of course, in this case, uh, um, ground-based measurements of uh, spectral induced fluorescence. You need the meteorology, crop data, soil hydraulic properties. I've shown a pathway of doing this with the EMI. And then you can um, test the model and, and put information into the model. So what do we need from the other uh, core projects? Uh, detailed assessment of subsurface properties to inform the digital agricultural avatar, agri agri digital agricultural avatar. information from uh, drones, and of course, crop soil and management data. One way of linking this is um, one could also do some upscaling of uh, soil, functional structural soil plant models. So go away from the summary models, but see that one uses these uh, functional structural soil plant models to um, better describe within the uh, 50 meter scale the plant growth and eventually also better consider the uh, crop growth properties, root water uptake properties, and so on. A third um, element that we have been thinking about is, um, it's not only about water, uh, agricultural production, it's also about fertilizer. And the idea is, um, can we use gaseous measurements of ammonia and HONO to get information use them as a proxy to estimate the ammonium, soil ammonium, and the nitrification activity. So uh, currently, uh, we can use these. We don't have them, these analyzers, but you can use them to uh, measure these uh, fluxes in the gaseous phase. So HONO is just an intermediate product between the, uh, in the, ammon in the whole um, nitrification uh, step, so you can also produces uh, gaseous component. And what we want to look at is whether we can use these two measurements to get information about these processes in the subsoil. And the idea would be, of course, to do such a management that one avoids the leaching of nitrogen into the subsurface. And the idea could be that uh, once one has such an, an approach, one would have these uh, analyzers available. They provide online information through approximations using these measurements of ammonium and nitrate. nitrite. And then you can also try to do a targeted application. So no need for sampling anymore. Now this is kind of a, a visionary work. I think it would be 
beneficial for Finerop to have this kind of, um, let's say, applications that are valuable also in, 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 uh, for practical farming. Um, yeah, the contributions um, with respect to this uh, ammonium or and um, HONO measurements uh, that we can contribute to different uh, core projects. And I think also an important element is, uh, which we discussed in the beginning when we were setting up Finerop is, can we determine environmental indicators using this system, but also to develop methods for in situ monitoring of biogeochemical and root zone processes. Um, of course, um, one can develop this method and technology, but one needs, of course, support to get it then also more into a kind of a practical application. Just not going to read it in detail. We also provide output, of course, to the uh, themes that we had and the rob sense. Just a brief word on um, isotopes. We have been discussing also in, in Jülich, can we use in a meaningful way isotope measurements in a kind of an operational setting? I think it will be much more difficult because this is our expensive uh, systems. Cannot imagine that a farmer will buy an adequate system with isotope measurements and so on just to monitor 100 meters. But it is for us in the development of what we are doing, this kind of providing this knowledge to the farmers at a scale below than 50 meters, we need, of course, to be quite sure about what we are predicting and what we are modeling. And so these uh, isotopes may help us in, for instance, looking at a partitioning of evapotranspiration because the eddy covariance system measures E and T, the evaporation coming from the soil, and the transpiration coming from the plant. So what we would like to know is what is the part <coughs> that comes from the plant <coughs> and what is the part that comes from the soil. We can model this, but we do not have any methods that allow us to verify exactly what we are doing. So it, these methods based on isotopes can help us in partitioning and to see how well the model is doing. And the same way, we can also uh, do this in the atmospheric part above the land surface is that we can have these uh, water and CO2 profiles. We measure them automatically. We just scan the atmosphere up and down. And then we can use isotope measurements to partition these fluxes. And this might also be very helpful for us to validate these models. And um, this is something uh, we uh, would be very valuable if that could be also part of the activities. What's the vision? What do we want to have at the end of Finerop? We would like to go for a real-time agricultural management that uses these drones, of course, robots, but based on a real-time prediction at the plant within field scale using these digital agricultural avatars. And we think that that can help in terms of an optimal management. I have just the idea that you can say, okay, I have a, a set of farmers, they have their fields. Currently, you have drones available that are automatically launched, come back automatically to the launching station. They can cover a large area. They can do this continuously, so they can every day you, you launch, they measure, they come back. They get information, questions, what do you do with this information? You can use it for scouting, as I said in the beginning, or for monitoring. But the exciting part is to put it in a kind of a predictive self-learning avatar. And that is the work that is to do. Set up, test, validate this avatar for a 50 meter scale. Developing the within field digital agricultural avatar using crop growth models and this uh, observation systems and expand this to nutrients, for instance, also go in the direction of nitrogen. And you need to do this because you measure the gaseous emission, but you want to know something about the soil. That's it. Thank you.
I'm sure that we have some questions. Please. Yeah, no. Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, the crop height is a very important input to the model, mm -hmm. and they can plan to use the uh, LIDAR mm -hmm. uh, to capture the, this information about the crop height. So, uh, my question is what is the benefit of using this uh, method uh, if you know that there is a method from uh, generating, generating crop height from uh, RGB images using a structure slow motion uh, approach? Is there a difference for the different crop? Is there any information about correlation between UAV-based crop height and uh, laser oh. crop height? Is this uh, different? I can't answer that. I can't answer that question. The only thing I see in the advantage of getting it from drones, if you use a lot or RGB, is that you can have a high repetitive mode, uh, and you get it over a full coverage. I can't imagine that that would be possible with, with, with laser scanning because, I mean, that's not an automated system as far as I understand it. So the whole idea is in the optimization. Sure, but in fact, we need only the height. It doesn't matter if the height is detected by, by stereo photography or by LIDAR. No. I mean, the best height possible. But okay. the idea of using the drone is that, that you can have this coverage and your repetitive mode. And this is, of course, what the model needs to do the predictions. Through the canopy. Through the canopy. And see yeah. if it's the structure yeah, of the source of the source. Yes. So you get a topography of the of the LIDAR. And how far that is relevant for the modeling that's something different. But I agree, you can get a very high resolved digital elevation model from that. We have been discussing this as an as an uh, is it important to look at frost pockets in the field? Because they are typically controlled by microtopography. So you could also use this LiDAR and drones to look at areas where there is a higher risk of having frost. Also an application that might be valuable. Yeah, thanks, Harry, uh, for the great overview. Uh, you said for the crop model and data assimilation exercises, you want to go finer than the 50 by 50 kilometer grid, right? So Meter. Within the 50 meters, yes. Within the 50 meters. So what's the intended spatial viability and also temporal viability you want to do the data assimilation at? Because in terms of fluorescence, you have that example of fluorescence. The fluorescence has a very high spatial and temporal resolution mm -hmm. if you really want to pick it up. Yeah. So yeah. what do you intend? To From the modeling design? perspective? Yeah. So the, the modeling design. perspective, if you, if you so you use the 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 the, the dash SMP to get the, the boundary conditions basically and the states for the zero to fifty meters, and then you do your crop growth model, but then and then you can go into into less than hours and the assimilation, no problem. You can inject as soon as you get the information from the drone, you inject it in your model. But there is no assumption about the, uh, the temporal resolution of the crop model is one day. No, well, that is something we will have to refine. To, you what, to what? That was my question. Well, to less, at least than one hourly. So at we least. Then you will have the, the diamond course of yes. measured fluorescence yes. from that particular spot yes. that will be used to yeah. right. the assimilation. Right. And what is the spatial resolution? Um, for the, the, the crop growth model? That, I mean, that would be, I mean, if you do the, the, the heterogeneity, that can be less than, than, that's almost point scale what you're doing. It's point scale. Millimeter. Yeah, but no, you're not going to millimeters. That is my question. No, you're not going to millimeters. You're going, let's say, at the plants, at the single plant, that would be the size that you can manage. Decimeter. Yeah. So yeah. you will not look into depth then, because we also have depth gradient in terms of Within the canopy. Well, that well, this is this is what this is what I was trying to point out. 
Um, yeah, yeah, well, you can, you can go from, the idea was you, you develop a functional structural plant model, which is at the one single plant. You can say, okay, and I do this, this uh, and I do these calculations at, at, at all the plants next to each other for a zero by 50 meter scale. And then the question is, is this computational possible or are you going to upscale your properties? So getting from a three-dimensional functional structural plot model to something that is effective and that incorporates all the heterogeneities and the variability in an effective model. This is something uh, one might have to look in, in, in Fenorop. So how to do it? I mean, the idea would be um, to get rid of the, of the I'm not um, proposing to use a, a sucrose model. I'm just was trying to outline what is the way to get to, the, to use information and to inject it in models. The idea would be to say, okay, we have this plant functional structural models, and how can we upscale them to something that is effective and reflects the heterogeneity in photosynthetic capacity, but also with respect to the soil. This is something that is basically upscaling work. And I think this is something where Jan and also Andrea are quite, quite interested in, and how to do this. Otherwise, it becomes computationally, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just, <laughs> you know, what I'm trying to outline is that it might provide a lot of links to ongoing activities in other uh, core projects, and that might, this modeling is a way of to integrate knowledge, and it has also a possibility of being of use to farmers doing um, practical work in the field. That is, that is, this is something we will have to come up with Fenerop. We can do a lot of fancy science, I'm, I'm a f in favor of fancy science, but after seven years, you will have to show, or we will have to show, what is the benefit in the end? How can it be used in, 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 in the field? And I think this, yeah, this is something we need to think about when we are proposing okay. research. You mentioned chlorophyll fluorescence as a proxy for cloud stress. Yes. Now, many nutrient deficiencies also affect the chlorophyll and the chlorophyll fluorescence, and then nitrogen. And I mean, I truly believe if you have a controlled experiment, you will see a very nice correlation between water quality, cloud stress, and chlorophyll. Well, one way, of course, is um, if you calculate forward the spectral induced fluorescence signal, you get, of course, information about the status of the crop also. And so you can use your uh, model to see whether you also have stress conditions with respect to the nitrogen or whether you have more stress conditions related to water. Um, in some areas, you probably could also exclude the fact that there is nutrient stress, more water stress. So I think it's, it's, you will have to disentangle the signal. And the only way to disentangle it is, is doing the modeling. I, I, I cannot come up with something. Or, or you, have, you have a different method. You combine different methods. I'm just now talking about um, the SIF, but you could use also more information than just the SIF. You could also use hyperspectral information and see whether you also have stress there that is related to nitrogen. I think you can, you can see this in the signal when you have nitrogen stress. So the idea would be this is just one way. You can use one sensor. You can also integrate many more sensors. So a drone can fly many more sensors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, of course, the data simulation. If you only do the states, you do just corrections. You do not change the model. That might, of course, have some impact on some other processes. The suggestion would also be, um, and that's what I was trying to, to point out: not only assimilate the fluxes and the states, but also estimate your parameters at the same time. 
And by doing so, you also, if you start changing the parameters at the same time, based on observations, you're also correcting processes everywhere in the system. So it's not only a matter of just assimilating soil moisture, that is one way, but you would at the same time also estimate and adjust your parameters to the system. That is a kind of, that would be the self-learning part for the model. You can do this for the parameter part. It's much more difficult if you have structural errors, model errors in your model on how, but then you would see this. I mean, if you cannot, I'm not a, sp a specialist on data simulation, is uh, other people, but I can imagine that you can also uh, analyze the biases that you see. So you have information in the bias. I mean, you correct for the state, you correct for the parameter. If you still see bias in there, then you have to do something on your model structure. And you see the biases, you see how they uh, develop. And then typically people do bias correction, just correcting the bias to get the prediction right, not necessarily improving the, the process. So if we see something that, um, that is a systematic bias, despite the fact that you, optimize, you use the, the states and the fluxes and the parameters to be updated, then you have to do something on your model. And that gives... No, no, not on the fly. <laughs> well, you could come up and say, I'd pick another modem. You know, I'm driving, I don't like the car, I take another car. <laughs> so it's just like a, like a, a gasoline station, you know. You, you drive the car and uh, or say, oh, there's a hearse company. I don't like the car, I take another car. No. Man, I mean, this not on, but this, this, this data simulation provides you information. And this is something that, that if you're only interested in forecasting, then you don't really care about where the bias comes from, you just correct the bias. Now, you can also see the bias as containing information. Perhaps there is also some interest in machine learning methods to, to come up and analyze this, this, the biases that you might see when you do this uh, assimilation work. I just threw in some ideas. Uh, the point is that you don't know all information, for instance, you don't know how much N is in the soil, so how will you correct? How much? Well, <coughs> that's why you need to have this ammonium uh, ono analyzer that gives you, <laughs> that gives you the, the nitrogen. It's all, it's all the question of how much, and there is, there is no single solution for such a complex problem in terms of sensors. So it will be always a combination of different methods if you go in this direction. How quickly the how quickly the quality of your model oh. might deteriorate. I mean, do you need to uh, can you wait for a, a day or two or three or four? I don't know. No, I have no idea. Uh, we have never worked on on injecting um, okay. drone information into models, and and yeah. I, I I would just be a stupid guess that I would that make. Might be an important it might be, and 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 for me the question is is more um, currently what is the information content from the different sensors in terms of informing the model because sometimes we know from experience that soil moisture is easy to measure but doesn't necessarily have a lot of information content if you want to go to improving your evapotranspiration fluxes there are other controls there so the question is to find out information that is valuable and this is part of the research what is valuable you, uh, some sensors probably probably the height is not at all um, relevant perhaps for the radiative transfer, I can imagine that it's important. But do you need more information? Do we need also have structural information? So this is, this is something open for research. I can't answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick question concerning the optimization problem that you saw. Yes. It would be interesting to, to hear a few terms, maybe what type of problem that is. Is it 
Ensemble yes, it's an ensemble Kalman filter. Oh, okay. We use an ensemble, yeah, I didn't mention that. So it's an ensemble Kalman filter, which has some assumptions in there, Gaussian distribution of states and fluxes and whatsoever of the parameters. Um, there are alternatives to an ensemble Kalman uh, filter. We have been using also these particle uh, filters, but they are much more time, time consuming in terms of uh, applying them. And then you, you loosen the restriction on the type of uh, probability density function that you, can, you must have. So you can have non-Gaussian distributions. We have been doing part of work uh, on our work was on particle filters. But currently it's a standard, well, sta it's a sample common filter, what we use. And there are also you have different options. You can do smoothing, non-smoothing. So you have various options on how to treat um, your data. You only do the, the particle, uh, the, the ensemble Kalman filter is one, just at that moment in time. But you can also look back in time, you can do the smoothing, you can do some averaging. So there are many, many opportunities that you have there to, and this is some kind of, well, it's, it's then it's a uh, modeling experience, I would say. Uh, you can, of course, do this analysis and see what is the best smoothing window that you can use. Uh, in order to use this, this backward information. So, thanks. How can you say optimal management? That's of the term that economists think a lot about as well. So, it might be optimal to maximize the yield yes. and then make a decision by applying this amount of fertilizer. But if you know the price of sugar beets in three months will be on a record low because the quota uh, result and that was there before. And you wouldn't apply any fertilizer maybe. Yeah, so have you thought about how you, what kind of information you need from economists in Europe to sort of stimulate other notions of how can that I have to be honest, no. I have to be honest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's why I give this presentation yet, is just to show that there is uh, potential uh, in, in terms of uh, tying economic thoughts in that. So, um, no, I didn't, to be honest. Uh, so, final question. No, besides, Thomas, I have the last I also just want to uh, stress the fact that we are having Fenero a unique opportunity to have hopefully a lot of a broad range of images and a broad range of and that probably we can disentangle the complexity by using uh, many different sensors. Mm, I agree. And the models, in addition, as data sources that when we combine them all, that we can also disentangle complex uh, stress phenomena. But uh, uh, another question was from the, you, you stressed that at a small spatial resolution, uh, soil heterogeneity. Yes. Is, uh, the was my perception when I was looking at these drone images yeah. from near to Zellhausen and I thought, okay, the farmer used the same crop, the same management, and, and in the end what you see is, is uh, the effect of the heterogeneity because at that scale the, uh, the, the, the weather conditions are the same, they don't change. Yes. This, 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 what my the question was on that, on that level, you showed the IMI yes. uh, measurement. Yes. My first question would be how did you translate the IMI signals into parameters of the model? And the second question, uh, can we expect from uh, some of our research units like uh, um, the root, so root team that we get uh, better information on a higher spatial resolution? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was some of course, there was some information that you use from the coring, basically to, to translate also the information from the EMI to the um, to the information of, the, of uh, with respect to soil that properties. Why you need this some yes, you need yeah to yeah the yes you have to translate because you get you get an electrical conductivity, and and with EMI that's already a mixed signal signal of water content, and and um, so well conductivity due to the presence of fertilizers or salts. And so um, that plays a role already. Therefore, GPR is, is basically measures directly 
the water content EMI is a mixed uh, signal. Well, 